Well, hello, my friends. Welcome back to Embrace the Question. This is another episode of Bible Study with me, me being Steve, and I am happy to be with you on this very fine day. It's beautiful outside, at least on the day of recording. It is very good to be with you. This is something I look forward to every week. We're in the book of Genesis. We've gone back to the beginning, and there are good reasons for doing so. You cannot, by Scripture's own admittance, you cannot understand the end of things unless you understand the beginning of things. You have to, you have to determine the end from the beginning. And if you understand that time repeats itself, it's cyclical, then what we have is nothing, according to Ecclesiastes, nothing new under the sun. Then we have this wheel that turns. And apparently, we don't often learn from our mistakes because we repeat them constantly. So this is valuable to go back and find out what happened in the beginning. We are in Genesis chapter 14. This one is a little bit I won't say dry, because for me it's very interesting, but there are a lot of long names. You'll get a kick out of hearing me attempt to pronounce them, but the truth is it's easy to get lost in the names. So if we can just read the entire thing, and then I'll go back and dissect it a bit, and we'll try to make some sense out of all of it, right? Let's go. All right, Genesis 14. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Kedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, these kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is, Zoar. And all these joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is, the Salt Sea. The Salt Sea, think the Dead Sea. Twelve years they had served Kedorlaomer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Kedorlaomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the, Raph defeated the Raphaim in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, and Emim in Shavakariathim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to El Mishvat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the, Amal the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in the Hezazon Tamer. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and they joined battle in the valley of Sidim, with Kedoleomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Literally the battle of five armies here. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits. And as the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all their possessions, all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their provisions, and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions, and went their way. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and of Aner. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men born in his house, 318 of them and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them, and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions, and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions, and the women and the people. Hmm, okay, let's, let's stop there. Because there, there is a slight departure in the flow from the first half of the chapter to the second. So let's, let's just see if we can figure out what's going on here. Remember, Sodom 
was in the Jordan. It was the it was the pretty area. It's the when Lot and Abram began to dispute, have issues with their people because of land, because of space. Lot went one way, Abram went the other. Lot went towards the Jordan Valley. Abram went the opposite direction. In the Jordan Valley was where Lot supposedly set up his tent, but now we find him actually a citizen of a city, Sodom. Okay, we know that that is not really a good place to settle, especially in coming days. So we have these kings that have been giving tribute to this guy named Cato Leomer. Cato Leomer was a king, apparently fairly powerful. He was over a confederate of four other kingdoms to form a five a five king confederacy. His name means a a handful of sheaves. A handful of sheaves. It's not something that makes you quiver inside to hear it, but that's what his name means in the literal. So these five kings led by Cato Leomer decide they want their subjects back. This was a, a forced tribute type situation. We don't really have any idea how large their armies were. When you think about marauding armies, you think of often thousands upon thousands of men. We know below that Abram was able to rescue Lot with 318 men, which was a great number of people for a, a single household. We'll get more back to that in just a second. This guy wanted his subjects back. Apparently, this was his bread and butter. He forced people into tribute situations. So he gathered his allies and came to reclaim what he considered his. In verse 10, we learn that the Valley of Sedim is full of bitumen pits. Think, uh, if, if you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, then you realize that there are areas in that park that are just bubbling pits of, of boiling mud, basically. You would never, ever want to fall into one of these. It's extremely hot, and uh, you could, I suppose, use that mud for a number of purposes. Bitumen is what Noah used to pitch the ark, to waterproof it. It was a useful product, like tar, tar pits. So obviously we're talking about a somewhat volcanic area. My parents recently went to the Canary Islands. You know that there, there's a very active volcano there in the Canary Islands, but on other islands, there are volcanic vents and they use, the locals use these vents to cook food. They'll put big iron grates on them, line chickens up on there, and sell them to tourists. Extremely hot air coming out of these vents. I would imagine that this area right here was very similar to that. And because we know this, many have surmised, I guess, that God used the volcanic nature of this to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. That the fire and brimstone from heaven was actually an explosion of volcanic nature, right? So, is it possible? Sure, it's possible. We don't know. We are guessing. But these bitumen pits uh, are appar apparently pretty dangerous. You know, the, that's one of the scary things about Yellowstone, is that there are areas there that you can walk, and some areas you can't. And sometimes you can't tell which is which. Sometimes it looks like it would be very safe to take a step out on this crusty ground with a little bit of moss growing on it, or maybe a few weeds. But in actuality, it's just an inch or two thick before you fall through it into some superheated mud, which you might not ever get out of. So if this was like that, Wow, what a horrible way to try to make an escape, wouldn't you say? Kato Leomer basically has a successful raid. He takes all that he wants, and he takes off to the north. 
an escapee comes into Abram's house and says, hey, somebody has raided Sodom, Gomorrah, Zoar, now all of these, and taken your, your nephew Lot with them. What shall we do? This is where we might learn a little bit about Middle Eastern family. Because Abram doesn't even seem to ponder this. He just takes his guys, gets them geared up, cameled up, whatever they had to ride on, and they take off after Lot. Now, you might think that, especially in our culture, well, Lot should never have gone that way. I knew it would be trouble for him if he went, went into Sodom. I knew that he was going to ask for trouble here. And, and we might just say, well, serves him right. But Abram doesn't do that. Abram, Abram is willing to immediately take action. So what does he do? Well, he takes 318 of his men born in his house. Now, what does that mean? Does Abram live in a ginormous uh, mansion where all these guys are born? No, it's, it's talking about, you know, in the Middle Eastern sense, the house of Abram, these, these are those in his family. Okay, there's probably many tents across many acres of his family, of his servants. So these guys were ready for war. This wasn't just all the males. This was the, all of the warring males. Okay, it's a pretty good group. It's reminiscent a bit of Gideon, who defeated a, a much larger force, I would imagine, with 300, right? So this is pretty interesting. Abram's taking 318. Why 318? What's the significance? Don't really know. I would think, though, that why name the number? Just to tell us that it's a small number? To tell us that it's a big number? In that day, 318 was a pretty good group. In that day, to have 318 in your household meant you were extremely powerful. Someone to be feared, in fact. Abram was someone to be feared, so God was already making his name great. So they went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, the city of Dan has not been founded yet. Either this was done as a, from the writer's standpoint, after the city had been founded, or perhaps, for clarity's sake, a scribe goes back and fills in the blanks so that we'd kind of have an idea of where all of this took place. Okay? It says he divided his forces against them by night. Again, reminded of Gideon, did the same thing. And his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. So they're in Syria. They are in Syria, the area of Syria. Uh, and this started out in the Jordan Valley, around the Dead Sea. So they've moved north into Syria. And he, he, brought, he brings back all of his possessions. And his kin, kinsmen lot with his possessions. Okay. Now let's read the rest of this. Because there's some interesting characters introduced to us. After his return from the defeat of Cato Leomer, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, or Shave, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to uh, the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap, or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. And I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten, and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share. All right. 
So we're introduced to this character named Melchizedek. Abram's coming back. He's just defeated the king, the kings really, that were in the confederacy with Cato Laomer. They're coming back home and they meet a priest by the name of Melchizedek. Melchi means king. It's a bit like, uh, it's, it's an inversion because it's used in a word, in a name, but it's an inversion of the word Melech, which is king, okay? Melech, king, Zedek, right, or righteousness. So king of righteousness. Melchizedek, king of Salem, or Jerusalem. It's, it's the king of peace, Salem, peace. Let's look at that. Surely our Strongs has that one right, right? King of Salem. There you go. Same as peaceful, Salem or Shalem, Shalem, from where we get Shalom, peace. Okay. Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of Jerusalem or king of peace. He brings forth bread and wine. So he's bringing forth the elements that we're all used to. The bread, the wine. The bread symbolizing the body of Christ. The wine symbolizing the blood of Christ. Okay, interesting because this is 2,000 years before Christ. Who was Melchizedek? That is a matter of debate. Nothing provable. Some say that Melchizedek was possibly Shem, and Shem was alive and well at this time, one of the sons of Noah. And he had also a very powerful house, Shem. Uh, but was it Shem? We don't know. Others think it was a theophany or a pre-incarnate person of Jesus. Could it have been? Could have been. We just don't know. It's impossible to know. So Melchizedek, the king of Salem, personally for me, I believe this was a mortal. Could have been Shem. I don't think it was a theophany. If I, if I find out different someday, I'm completely fine with that. He brings forth bread and wine, and he is the priest of the Most High God. Now, why... When, when we get into Hebrews and it starts talking about Jesus being of the order of Melchizedek, what does that mean? The order of Melchizedek is a priestly order that is somewhat divine in nature, more so than, say, something that can be traced through human lineage. I would say like the Levites. The Levites became the Levitical order, or the Levitical priesthood, but we know where they came from. We can trace their lineage all the way back to Jacob, right? Okay, not so with Melchizedek. Melchizedek, we don't know where he came from, and we don't know where he's going. So in that aspect, he is a very divine picture of a priesthood that is eternal. It's ongoing, never-ending. And that is why Jesus is part of this order, part of an eternal priesthood. So he blesses Abram, and Abram tithes to him. This is the first time we learn about the tithe, where the tithe literally means the tenth. It means if you've got ten, then you give one away. That's the tithe, and it's our first. It's our introduction to it in Scripture. Notice. We are a long ways, again, before, before the law is given. So you can't call the tithe part of the law. This was something Abram knew about and practiced, perhaps even uh, came up with it by divine mandate here. I don't know. Now, I can't tell from Scripture itself. But Abram tithes, and it's our first introduction to the concept of tithing. The king of Sodom says to Abram, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. What's he saying? He's like, Abram, 
you've recovered everything for me. You've recovered all my people. You've recovered all my goods. So Abram, why don't you just give me my people back? We'll go home and you can keep all the stuff. That's generosity. That's a, that's a tremendous offer by a guy that probably wasn't all that righteous, right? We, we know where Sodom falls in the, in the scale of righteousness. It's not even registering, okay? And maybe Abram knew that. I don't know. But Abram didn't want to take his offer because, and his reason is, I have lifted my hand to God, I have vowed to God that I won't take a thread or a shoelace or anything that is yours so that you can't say I've made Abram rich. Abram was protecting something. He was protecting his covenantal relationship with God. And it technically hadn't become covenantal just yet. But he was still protecting a relationship where it was valuable to Abram that everything he had was attributed to God and God alone. That's something worth remembering. That's something worth pondering. What do we do? Who is your provider? Who made you wealthy? Was it your employer? Was it your parentage? Was it your vast knowledge of business and marketing, or was it God who made everything possible? These are things that Abram thought about and had vowed already to God that he would not take a dime from anyone. A very old, 2,000-year-old Middle Eastern dime. Okay? Except anything we've eaten Anything my allies need, they're not under the same commitments to God that I've made, so let them take anything that you're willing to part with. So I'm sure that in this story and from this event, the Abram's, Abram's friends, Abram's allies, made out rather well. They left rich men, so the rich get richer. What do you think? What do you think about this story? There's a lot of weird names in it, but it's fascinating. You know, if you've ever seen the, the movie, The Scorpion King, starring Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, can you smell what The Rock's got cooking? Well, if you've ever seen that, a lot of people have wondered where in history that Scorpion King, he's actually a historical figure. Who was he? And we don't really know. Um, I think that some have placed him back during these days, this, this time period, and I could be wrong. Um, but I, I, I recognize some of the historical data on that crosses some of the historical data we see in Genesis as well. So, interesting stuff to me. Uh, Abram rescues Lot. Now, we're getting into the area, aren't we, where we're going to see Sodom and Gomorrah mentioned again, and Lot seems to stay in trouble in this area. He seems to stay in trouble ever since he's taken the good land. Hmm. What are we going to do with him? Well, I certainly appreciate you guys joining me in with these little studies. I want this to be a blessing to people for as long as YouTube is a thing. I want people to be able to come back and do a study on Genesis forever. And if we decide to move to Exodus after this, so be it. But I want people to be blessed by the plowing we are doing right now. So I hope you're having a great week. And until next week, peace. <music>